try to stay ahead of the curve here and ahead of the fraudsters to, to make sure that we can prevent that fraud in these new payment methods. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Hacking Humans podcast, where each week we look behind the social engineering scams, the phishing schemes, and criminal exploits that are making headlines and taking a heavy toll on organizations around the world. I'm Dave Bittner from the CyberWire, and joining me is Joe Kerrigan from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Hello, Joe. Hi, Dave. Got some good stories to share this week, and later in the show, my conversation with Jim Ducharme. He is the CEO of Outseer. We're going to be talking about buy now, pay later scams. So who's got the advantage in cybersecurity, the attacker or the defender? Intelligent people differ on this, but the conventional wisdom is that the advantage goes to the attacker. But why is this? Stay with us and we'll have some insights from our sponsor, Know Before, that put it into perspective. All right, Joe, before we jump into our stories, we have some follow-up here. Do you want to uh, lead us into a couple of notes we got from listeners? Uh, The first one comes from Mark, and this one's directed at me. He wrote in with a comment about my story from last week where I remarked that 78% of phishing happens on a weekday. And Mark correctly pointed out that weekdays make up 71% of the days. (laughs) Okay. So nothing gets by Mark. Yeah. (laughs) That's that's an astute observation, Mark, and one I completely missed. <laughs> These guys don't take holidays. Like, they don't take breaks. I spend a third of my life asleep. It's just <laughs> right. a crazy thing. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. All right. So well, why don't you read the next one? I have some comments on this one. <laughs> okay. They're going to mirror some comments I've already made, but... All right. Uh, It says, uh, hi, Dave, Joe, and the person monitoring this mailbox. That would be our producer, Jen. Right. (laughs) It says, uh, love the show and listen every week. On this week's episode, Carol was talking about parents tracking their children, and I had to write in with my personal story. When I was a senior in high school back in 2004 or 5, I was dating a girl whose dad worked in the IT industry. I don't recall what specifically. As she and I were 16 or 17, we were exploring in ways that teenagers of that age tend to do. But where we really messed up was in that we would talk about it over AOL Instant Messenger, as was the style at the time. (laughs) What we didn't know was that her dad had installed a rat keylogger on her computer. In his reviewing of the chat, he saw what we were discussing and had what I would call an overreaction. (laughs) Joe, you're a father of daughters. Yes, I am. A father of a daughter, but I love her very much and want to do everything I can to protect her. (laughs) It goes on and says, she and her parents met with me and my parents, and we all had a long, awkward conversation about the birds and the bees and the potential consequences of our actions. Yeah. She and I did not wind up dating much longer after that. I wonder why. In the end, I suppose I should thank him as he's the Joe Chill to my Bruce Wayne, and this event is what caused me to go into cybersecurity myself. Huh. And that's from John. Yes. All right. Yeah. Dave, I'm going to say this again. <laughs> yeah. I am so glad there was none of this stuff around when I was a kid. Yeah. Uh, also, I would never install a rat slash key logger on my kid's computer. I think that is a little bit surreptitious. I agree. I um, agree. I, I, I think there's a certain amount of stuff when it comes to your kids that you, you're you better off not knowing. Right. Like there's a, there's an amount of – I want to know the general gist of what's going on. Yeah. I don't need to see the the details. Right, I don't need yeah. to know how I, the, the I, sausage is made, as yes, it were. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I, I think that's exactly right. And and to pull everybody aside and have a conversation with both both sets of parents, no. <laughs> yeah. That, that why did this relationship end? I don't know who ended this relationship, but I think I would have been like, you know what? I don't think this is going to work out. Yeah. And that would have been it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I just keep thinking, our kids are having a healthy, natural, physical relationship, and I'm not okay with that. Right. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, we were all young once, right? Yes. We all, we all went through the, all those awkward times. Yeah, I def- sounds- if I knew about this, I definitely would have pulled my daughter aside. We, my wife and I would have had a conversation with my daughter. Yeah. But there's no way I would have involved the other, the other kid's parents. Right. Because of exactly what you're saying. This is, this is exactly what... What 16 to 16, 17 year old kids do, right? Yeah. You know, maybe you don't like it. Uh, maybe, maybe, yeah, you want to make sure it's not getting out of hand, of course. 
Right. right. You just want to make sure that they're whatever they're up to, that they're doing it safe and responsibly, that right. they understand the potential consequences. The risks are enormous. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Your life could go off on a different direction. That's correct. But, uh, you know, at the same time, you know, I don't think you want to freak them out or shame them. or anything Right. Yeah. Like I think that, shaming so. them is a the wrong answer. And, yeah. and just about everything, <laughs> uh, shaming, them is, shame, shaming someone is, is the wrong answer. Yeah. All right. Well, our thanks to uh, John for writing in to us. Uh, we would love to hear from you. Uh, you can send us an email to hackinghumans at thecyberwire.com. All right, Joe, let's jump into some stories this week. Uh, I'm going to kick things off for us. Uh, my story comes from uh, Wired. This is written by Lily Hay Newman, uh, who has been a guest on our show before, a mm-hmm. good, uh, well-known and respected writer over there at Wired. Uh, And this is uh, titled, A Big Bet to Kill the Password for Good. And this is, um, what what this really gets at is that the FIDO Alliance, uh, Joe, can you say off the top of your head what FIDO stands for without looking it up? It's, no. Uh, And the funny (laughs) thing is, I I have read what that acronym means within the past two weeks. Okay. And it, I want to say that the FI means one word. Mm-hmm. Uh, and DO is two is so it's not really an acronym like You're close. You're close. So FIDO stands for Fast Identity Online. Okay, so the ID stands for one word. That is okay. correct. That's I, right. I knew so, it was in there somewhere. <laughs> so FIDO, they, and they're uh, one of these industry consortiums that yep. uh, you, you know it, members of industry get together to try to uh, solve common problems, and that's what the FIDO Alliance is, and I believe they've been at it since 2013 or so. Yep, been going at it for a long time. Yeah, well-respected. Um, well, they just published a white paper uh, that really lays out their vision for moving us to the next step, which they think is a passwordless world. Um, we can hope, Dave. We can hope, <laughs> yeah. Um, and this article uh, is really interesting. I mean, some of the points that it makes are that in order for this to happen— It needs to be easier than using a password. Right. And I I think one of the things they point out here rightly that we've certainly talked about is that uh, passwords are easy, but good use of passwords is hard. Yes, <laughs> right? that's correct. If you only had one password, uh, that would be pretty easy. In fact, there's a whole company who's uh, named their company after the notion of one password. Right. Um, I but, believe they're called one password. <laughs> yes, exactly. But uh, – uh, but having to keep track of multiple passwords and secure passwords and long passwords is is difficult. Yes, so, it is. Without a password manager, it's almost impossible. Yeah. So the FIDO Alliance has uh, come out with this white paper. And uh, basically what they're saying is that now that we're at the point where pretty much everybody has a mobile device, yep. that we should be able to move on and use those mobile devices as our authentication mechanism mm-hmm. that we could we can uh, you know sling around cryptographic keys in such a way combined with the uh, capabilities of these devices biometric sensors so again most mobile devices have either a fingerprint sensor or a uh, some sort of face scanning sensor yep. or both <laughs> yep. so a uh, combination of those uh, the cryptographic capabilities the secure enclaves all that kind of stuff and the fact that these devices are pretty much universal now means that we should be able to get away with passwords. Um, the other point they make here is that by having these things stored in the cloud, and this article references uh, the iCloud keychain, which is right. Apple's system for doing this. And, uh, you know, Google has the same sort of thing mm-hmm. in uh, other systems. But uh, this article mentions Apple's version. What's great about this is if you lose your mobile device uh, or get a new one or whatever – um, there's, it's not a problem because right. you just log into your account in iCloud. All these keys get transferred back in. Everything gets checked and verified and all that sort of stuff. And you're off and running without having to go through the password dance that so many of us have gone through. <laughs> password dance. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to see what that looks like. <laughs> it's kind of like uh, the way Elaine danced on Seinfeld. Right. That's yeah. the password dance. They should yeah. also call it the hassle. <laughs> that's what, <laughs> that's what it looks like. Right, right. Right. So uh, th- that's the, the, the upside of this. Um, before I, I uh, get your commentary on this, Joe, I want to uh, – I'm going to razz you a little bit uh, okay. here because they, they have a pull quote from uh, – Johns Hopkins cryptographer Matthew Green, ah, Matt one, Green. Of, one yes. of your colleagues, yep. right? Yep. And uh, he says, schemes like passkey could work and be more secure than passwords as they stand now. 
But if the user interface for inter-device transfers sucks on some devices, it will suck for all of them, which would continue to discourage use. Boy, just the, the type of eloquence I come to expect from a Johns Hopkins professor, <laughs> Joe. <laughs> well, Matt Green is very good at, at speaking in plain terms. <laughs> uh, if, you, if, you, if you really want to see him explain incredibly complex things in plain terms, check out his blog. It's it's. Very well done. Yeah. And, and he and is he's, right. he's, he's kind of the go-to guy for right. articles like this because yep. of his ability to uh, put these complex cryptographic things into terms that everybody can understand. Yeah, he's so. good. And uh, as is our other professor, who's currently on sabbatical right now, Abhishek Jain. Mm. Uh, these guys are, you know, good cryptographers are valuable. Good cryptographers who can explain things to you and how they work. Few and far between. <laughs> right, right. Right. And and we have two of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what do, you, what do you make of this? I mean, do you think – it seems to me like the transitional period is going to be the hardest thing. Yeah. Uh, well, the, tr the way you do the transition is you you make the – this new method of, of uh, authentication the default and allow people to still use passwords and tell them passwords are going to be phased out over time. Mm -hmm. uh, so – that's that's how you do it. My concern here is that there's still the single point of failure, uh, and I don't know how we get away from this. I'm, I, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to diminish what's going on here because I agree this will be much more secure. Yeah. For for people because we are notoriously bad at picking passwords. Right. And if we don't, and, and very few people use password managers. Right. Despite the fact that you and I have been screaming from the mountaintops for years and years and years <laughs> to do this. No one listens to us, Dave. Yeah, well. Um, so, right. So, uh, yeah, is, this is great. But what about the, uh, you know, you, you said everything's stored in the cloud. Mm -hmm. If I can get access to your iCloud account or, or compromise your Google account where all this stuff is backed up and stored, that's the keys to the kingdom now. Well, but so, uh, yes, that's a good point. And, and what this article points out is that the way that this is handled – um, all of that is encrypted. So not right. even – so, for example, you put your stuff in iCloud, uh, Apple doesn't have access to it. Right. But when you go out and get a new phone – Right. Right. And you you have to demonstrate that you are who you say you are. Yeah. When you get a new I, Apple device – I just got a new Google device, by the way. Okay. I had to reconfigure all of the biometrics on here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Somebody else could have reconfigured the biometrics on here under my account. Oh, I see what you're saying. Right? Yeah. yeah. So – you know, I, I don't know. You and, ultimately, still still have to have some way to prove that you are. Who yeah, you there are. still has to be some kind of proof to to. Uh, yeah, exactly. Some some kind of identity management mm -hmm. product in here or or process. But I agree that even just going to this would be a makes makes the problem of get, breaking into someone's account exponentially harder. Yeah, because now. I actually have to physically approach somebody or, or go through the entire process of, of uh, impersonating somebody and incur the cost of buying a new device, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. means I can't do this en masse anymore. Right. Right. Particularly if, if you use Apple, there are no competitor devices out there. Mm -hmm. Right. So if for every person I want to well, – well, if I'm, I guess I could do it with multiple people, right, or multiple people on one device. But I'm going to have to go out and buy an Apple device. Yeah. And then start using it specifically for – impersonating people. Well, and you know, I, I think what the ultimately, and I, I, the thing about having the Fido Alliance lead the way with something like this right. is that we can hope for a world where this would be cross-platform, where if I decided that I wanted to switch from an Apple device to an Android device, right. that everything would still flow through with me. Yep. Right now, as you point out, you know, you're kind of stuck on an operating system. Yeah. It's hard to get off of uh, an Apple device if you're if if you want this convenience. Mm -hmm. So if we could move to a standard like this that was truly a standard and was interoperable between operating systems, to me that would be the real uh, you know fantasy. I, I agree <laughs> right? with you 100. Right. And hopefully we'll get there. I mean, you know, Fido has many of the big names are part of this alliance. Yep. So if it's going to happen, um, you know, the Fido has Google, Microsoft, and Apple. So if it's going to happen, this is probably this is where it's going to happen. happening. Yeah. Right. All right. We'll have a link to that article in the show notes. Again, that's over on Wired, uh, written by Lily Hay Newman. That's my story this week. Joe, what do you have for us? Dave, my story comes from a website called Bankless Times, which I had never heard of before, but it's like a <laughs> cryptocurrency news site. Okay. Um, there is a company called Unchained Capital. 
All right. Which is a Bitcoin financial services provider. Okay. I find it ironic that they call themselves unchained. Uh huh. When they are talking about a cryptocurrency based on a blockchain, you are very much chained. <laughs> okay. To the blockchain. Right. Uh, but I think their 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 uh, business model is collaborative custody of uh, hmm. cryptocurrency. Okay. What's now, that? I'll tell you, it seems antithetical to the idea of cryptocurrencies to me. Okay. Uh, but it's essentially uh, key splitting for wallet access hmm. is what it looks like from – I did a curse review, right? Yeah. So yeah. now in order for you to have your Bitcoin moved out of a wallet, then this – not bank, but this unchained capital has to help you with that process. I can see that value as a fraud prevention device. I see. Right. So it's is it kind of like you know like I've I've been involved with some nonprofits who have a system where you know uh, if a check is going to be written in more than a certain amount it requires two signatures right yeah. that this is kind of along okay. those those lines I think so yeah. yeah something like that okay but suffice to say they have uh, a a business based on Bitcoin right like any business they worked with an email marketing company and this email marketing company was called Active Campaign okay and about a month ago. Unchained decided they were no longer going to do business with Active Campaign. Hmm. I don't know what they, you know, as a business, you switch providers all the time. Maybe sure. they decide you're going to in house it. I don't know. Yeah. They say we're not going to do this anymore. So Unchained says to Active Campaign, we're done. Please delete all of our data. Mm. That's when the bad guys come in <laughs> about a month later. <laughs> okay. Right? Uh, an attacker pretending to be a staff member from Unchained Capital gets on a chat, a web chat with an active campaign support representative and gets them to reactivate an unchained capital account. Hmm. Next, they convinced another active campaign support person on the same chat interface to add an administrative user with a username and password without providing any confirming email addresses. Hmm. Okay. Right. And they, gave this information or gave this account access to this attacker. All right. The attacker was then able to change the password on the original account that had been reactivated and access all of the information that Unchained Capital had provided to Active Campaign hmm. as part of their marketing campaign. So this is a business relationship between a business to business relationship, right? I say to, uh, I'm on Chain Capital, you're active campaign. So I say to you, Dave, look, here's a uh, here's a list of all my customers, uh, their usernames, their, their email addresses. Right. And I need you to manage uh, sending these people email. And you go, mm -hmm. that's fine, I'll do that. And then yeah. I say to you, Dave, uh, I'm done doing business with you. Please delete my data. And you, data. And you go, sure. Yeah. But you don't delete the data okay. because that's the crux of the point is the data wasn't deleted. Right. And it was, a and these guys were able to access it. Mm -hmm. I, I should have made that more clear early on, I guess, but I, I, that's the major point. Yeah. So here's what was lost. Usernames to the uh, to the Unchained Capital platform, Yeah. right? Email addresses, naturally. Mm -hmm. yep. Account status, okay. whether it was open or closed. IP addresses, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, whether the client had active multi-signature vault, which is the product that they sell. Yeah. Or they had received a loan from Unchained Capital. I don't mm. know what kind of loans they work in. Maybe they do Bitcoin loans. That's, right. that's a thing. Okay. Um, what was not lost was a lot of PII, right? So well, that's good. Unchained Capital gave some information about uh, about customers away, but not all of it. Yeah. I don't know There's why. There's no they, reason the marketing company would need a right. lot of the PII. I, I, there, there is some questions about in, in the information that was lost. Why does Unchained Capital need a user name? For the platform, mm. uh, the, an email address I understand because you're going to send them an email, right? Right. Uh, the IP address was probably actually collected by this this email company. Yeah. From users that clicked on links, uh, account status. Okay, maybe you want to send emails that, that uh, I know you closed your account with us. Please come back. Mm -hmm. Those kind of things. Mm -hmm. uh, so I get I get why the rest of the information is in there, but you can easily associate a username with an email address on your own end. You don't need to provide that to somebody. Mm. What was not lost was a, a lot of good personal identifiable information like dates of birth, bank account numbers, physical addresses, passwords, balances, social security numbers, IDs, phone numbers, you know, Bitcoin addresses, loan balances, yeah. and all the statements and everything. Okay. So good division of data for the most part. Uh, like I said, I, I'm, I'm dubious about why you needed to send usernames, but it, what, what's done is done. So there's risk for customers here. 
And, and that's one of the things Unchained Capital is doing with this press release that they're, they're saying, be careful because now the bad guys have your email address and they know what kind of customer you are. Mm-hmm. Whether you have a closed account, an open account, maybe a balance, you know, a loan balance. Maybe they're going to harass you or try to convince you that uh, you're going to make your loan payments to a new Bitcoin address, right? Mm. I can see that as an attack vector. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe they're going to say, um, I don't know how they would scam a a dual signature thing, uh, a, a somebody who holds a dual signature wallet to provide their part of the signature if that does any good. Mm-hmm. I think I think it's probably going to be mainly with the uh, with the loan payments. Anyway, there are lessons I want everyone to take away from this. For consumers, your data is everywhere <laughs> and is provided willy nilly to uh, to other providers who may not keep it as secure as you think they are. Yeah. Right. Or as the as the other as the even the the customer company here, Unchained Capital did a good job. They said we're done doing business. Please delete it. Mm-hmm. And this company, Active Campaign, just said, "Oh sure, we'll delete it," and didn't bother to delete it. Yeah. Right. So you really have to understand that your data gets passed around. And, and may not be cared for properly. For businesses, limit the data that you share with your partners, uh, particularly where you have any kind of financial responsibility to your customers. Uh, and I think it's just generally, I know that there are a lot of companies out there whose entire business model is customer data. But when you're talking about your business model being something else, guard that data with great prejudice, I guess. <laughs> you know? yeah. You know, I think one of the challenges I could see here is if your active campaign or, a, you know, a company like them. Right. Um, and somebody comes to you and says, hey, we're done. You know, we want de- to please delete all our data. Right. Right. I suspect it happens from time to time that then a few days later, a few weeks later, a few months later, they come back in a cold sweat and saying, right. please tell us you didn't delete all our data. <laughs> <laughs> right. I imagine, I imagine that is exactly right. Right. You know, that's a good point. <laughs> so, so if your active camp, it seems to me like if your active campaign, maybe the thing you do, and I don't know if this is what they did or not, but maybe you say, uh, very well, we will delete your data. Our standard operating procedure is data gets deleted in X number of days. Right. And maybe that's 10 days, maybe that's 60 days. I don't yep. know what it is, but then, you know, then before you actually hit the delete button, you go back to your customer and you say, okay, today is zero day, right? right. We, t- t- today is the day we're deleting your data. And once it's gone, it's gone for good and we cannot get it back. We're just calling to, to verify you really want us to hit the delete button. Right. And then you do. Um so, you know, I don't know who knows to what degree any of that might or might not have been going on behind the scenes. Right. But I can imagine that that's a thing. I can and imagine so, that as well. So I have a little bit of sympathy for active campaign in that sometimes if you don't immediately delete the data, you can be a hero. Right. Right. In this case, the opposite happened. You're not. Right. Yeah. In this case, you're the, you look like the, I don't want to say incompetent, but you, maybe because your point is valid. Right. Yeah. But you're, but you're not the villain. The bad guy is the villain in this one. Sure, right? the guy sure. that broke in. Uh, they could have better processes, though. Yeah, they, you could have better processes. In place. Yeah, absolutely. this is not something you do just over a chat interface because that could be anybody talking to you, especially with right. no, no right. email. That's a good point too. Coming yeah. through. Yeah, right. To have to, to to enable an account that had basically what was it admin admin access, access over chat. Right. That seems a little bit. Willy nilly. It me. does. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why I err on the side, or that's why if I'm erring, I'm erring on the side of there's other things in here that point to something not being well managed, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we, we will have a link to that story in the show notes. Uh, Joe, it is time to move on to our catch of the day. Dave, our catch of the day comes from a listener named Matt, and Matt writes, Hi, Dave and Joe. I'm a longtime listener to the CyberWire podcast, and I especially enjoy hacking humans. I received the email below three times within 15 minutes, (laughs) which I thought you might find qualifies as a catch of the day. It it does. It's definitely a good (laughs) catch of the day. As soon as I saw it, those three times, a field of red flags popped up in my mind, from this Latin American source, but then suddenly multi-jurisdictional, multi-organizational, eminently charitable council, union, or, or organization that wanted to give me 
twenty and a half million dollars. <laughs> okay. Uh, why don't you Why don't you read this uh, <clears throat> this email, Dave? This is all right. It goes like this. Hello. My name is Cindy Marisol Benavides, Washington, D.C., currently serving as the National Director for Civic Engagement and Mobilization for the League of United Latin American Citizens, the oldest civil rights Hispanic organization in the country. The League of United Latin American Citizens is in conjunction with the Global Financial Integrity in offering temporary relief funds of $572,470,000 to small business owners to address the COVID-19 pandemic, economy, job growth, educational attainment, political influence, real estate housing, health, civil rights, rents, and loan. However, at the International Financial Organization annual meeting in Dubai, United Arab Emirates, which convened world leaders to discuss the global, regional, and industrial agendas in the middle of each year. That's the end of the sentence. That's, the the sentence. <laughs> That's not a sentence. It's just a, all right. It was agreed, among other things, and in with the global financial integrity, that making growth sustainable, making growth inclusive, and harnessing technology for good is a priority and must be tackled without delay. The amount which was awarded to you is U.S. $20.5 million. Speaking with the United Nations Association of the USA and with the Council of Europe adding the Asian Parliamentary Assembly are all in support of the payoff of beneficiaries from countries in Europe who are under the European Union organization, also USA and Asia. So everybody's in, Dave. Everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Poor penguins in Antarctica. Right. <laughs> Therefore, the EU Parliament, which is headquartered in Strasbourg, France, and has administrative offices in Luxembourg City, initiated an electronic random pick. And through this electronic random pick, your email was chosen for the implementation of making sustainable growth and harnessing technology for good. Funds have been mapped out for those picked in this process, and the disbursement will be monitored by the Global Financial Integrity Representative. You are therefore advised to contact Mrs. Jan Schakowsky, who will monitor the release of your funds. Here's her email contact. Note, our organization has well donated over $200 million to the people of Ukraine for the ongoing crisis to help distribute foods, medication, and shelter to the 150 million refugees who fled Ukraine, to Poland, and to others who has fled to their neighboring countries for safety. We stand with Ukraine and we work for peace. Best regards, Cindy Marisol Benavides. Ooh, this is a good one. There's a little bit of everything in here, this, Joe. This, first off, this scammer is one name dropper. Oh, I, yeah? <laughs> yeah. I did a little bit of research. Uh, okay. Miss Benavides is, in fact, affiliated with the, with LULAC, um, L U L A C, which is what Latin, the League of U, League of United Latin American Citizens. This is an American organization. Okay, right. Uh, so that organization exists. It exists, and, and Ms. Benavides is the CEO. It says she's the executive director of communication or of community engagement at the top. Yeah. Right. But no, she's the CEO. She's the head of this organization. Huh. Um, the name that they say Jan Skakowski. Yeah. That's the name of a U.S. House of Representatives member. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> not not anybody from uh, whatever organization it is. There, is. All these organizations that are listed in this email actually exist. Okay. Right? Which is really interesting. Uh, and it looks like somebody just did a Google search and and found, oh, like the uh, the EU parliament. Oh, they have – and on, on Wikipedia it says they meet in, the, in, in France and they have offices in Luxembourg. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's, it's – uh, it's very interesting. Uh, the IFO is not related at all to any of this stuff. That's not what they do. Yeah. Um, but they're just crammed in here, shoehorned, if you will. I, I What caught my eye was uh, how they sort of tacked on the situation in Ukraine. Yeah. Which, of course, is is terrible right. uh, and heartbreaking and, and all of those things. But um, uh, it also struck me that they talk about 150 million refugees who fled Ukraine. I don't think Ukraine has 150 million Citizen. citizens. I, I think right? you're right. <laughs> I, I want to say Ukraine has in like in the 30 million. I think their population is comparable to Canada. Something, right. Something like that. I don't mean to make light of any of that. Right. But no, this but is, I mean, this, this is number another, is way an, off. Another error. Right. Right. They're off right. by an order of magnitude. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Well, yeah. uh, do I, not respond to this email. Yeah, uh, the, I, I don't think you're going to get your $20.5 million Yeah, there. the email they have for Jank Skakowski. First off, in, later on, they address Jan as Mr. Skakowski, mm. right? Uh, but the email they have is actually 
has a domain that is like an impersonation domain with oh. the World Integrity, uh, World Fund Integrity, or something like that. I see. It's interesting. All right. Well, that is a good catch of the day. So thanks to our listener for sending that in to us. Again, we would love to hear from you. You can email us. It's hackinghumans at the cyberwire.com. Now let's return to our sponsor's question about the attacker's advantage. Why do the experts think this is so? It's not like a military operation where the defender is thought to have most of the advantages. In cyberspace, the attacker can just keep trying and probing at low risk and low cost, and the attacker only has to be successful once. And as No Before points out, email filters designed to keep malicious spam out have a failure rate of over 10%. That sounds pretty good. Who wouldn't want to bat nearly 900? But this isn't baseball. If your technical defenses fail in one out of 10 tries, You're out of luck and maybe out of business. The last line of defense is your human firewall. You can test that firewall with Nobefore's free phishing test, which you can order up at nobefore.com slash fish test. That's K-N-O-W-B-E, the number four, dot com slash fish test. Hi, right, Joe. Uh, I recently had the pleasure of speaking with Jim Ducharme. He is CEO of a company called Outseer. Uh, and what we were discussing was buy now, pay later scams. A uh, real interesting uh, explanation of what those are and why they continue to, uh, to grow. Uh, here's my conversation with Jim Ducharme. So BMPL is, is the latest in uh, uh, some new ways to allow consumers to pay for goods and services. So we're all used to paying online with our credit cards um, uh, or even in person in credit cards. But buy now, pay later offers another way uh, to pay when you check out. So you may see this in, in any online store. When you go to check out, say, how would you like to pay? You're going to pay credit card. Um, and now you'll see these these buy now, pay later, putting on installment plans. Uh, so it really helps people uh, to, to take large purchases and break them down into sort of installment plans, if you will. Uh, and alternative ways to to pay for goods and services, as I said. And what's going on behind the scenes here? Is this a a third party who provides the, the financing to the merchant for this, or how does it generally set up? Yeah, in some cases, uh, it, it is new uh, payment vendors that are establishing relationships with these merchants. So you're doing business with a whole new entity, as opposed to, for example, using your credit card. You you know you may mm-hmm. have a Visa, MasterCard, American Express card that you already have an account. And when you shop at a merchant, you just give them the card numbers. In some cases with the buy now, pay later, you're dealing with an entirely new entity that you can even sign up for as you're checking out. So if you'd like to use some of these buy now, pay later services, they'll actually enroll you in their service, create a buy now, pay later account, and then pay for the goods and services uh, to the merchant. In other cases, there's what we call the retroactive model buy now, pay later, where you still use your credit card like you always would. And then after the purchase, having nothing to do with the merchant, you can go to your respective bank uh, and say, hey, I'd like to put that purchase on an installment plan. Hmm. So we actually see both models happening today in the space of buy now, pay later. But mostly you're seeing the credit card companies do that in response to giving consumers that flexibility of the installment plan um, so when you're checking out, because consumers going, hey, you know, I don't want to spend a hundred bucks, but I don't mind spending uh, three payments of thirty three dollars a month. Mm-hmm. So cons- you know, so the credit card companies start to lose business against these buy now pay later companies. So they're they're also starting to offer the same flexibility of easy installment plans. I see, a- and of course, anywhere where there's money changing hands, that's an opportunity for fraud, and and that's something you and your colleagues have been tracking. That's exactly right. Um, you know, that's the challenge with as, as we innovate all these wonderful new ways to pay is great opportunities for fraudsters to find new weak points uh, in these solutions. And, and that's exactly what we look at. And we try to stay ahead of the curve here and ahead of the fraudsters to, to make sure that we can prevent that fraud in these new payment methods. Well, take us through some of the things that you all are tracking. How, how are the, the frauds being executed? Yeah. So in some cases, uh, you know, it's really what's old is new. 
attackers are using a lot of the same techniques they used before of either account takeover or in some cases a new type of fraud called synthetic identity fraud. And what that really is 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 when um, in synthetic identity fraud, when when a fraudster goes to check out, they'll they'll use social engineering or other means to basically uh, steal somebody's identity and pretend to be you and just have the have the merchandise shipped to them. So we see this quite a bit where, you know, um, uh, somebody creates an identity or, or uses a synthetic identity to pretend to be somebody, get that installment plan, purchase the goods and services. And then by the time fraud is detected, the ripoff has already happened, if you will. In, in the case of account takeover, you know, again, a similar sort of thing where, where people are stealing credentials uh, or ways to get into an account so that they can able and again, enable this this new way to pay and and basically steal those goods and services using somebody else's account uh, or identity. So when fraud occurs in a case like this, who ultimately is on the hook? Is it the consumer? Is it the merchant? Or is it the BNPL provider? Yeah, great question. So again, as we as we introduce these new payment methods, that's always one of the challenges of of where you know where is the liability. With your credit card, as as you probably know, the consumer is is typically not responsible uh, for the fraud, and the and the credit card company is responsible for that. And so they've put a number of controls in place to help prevent fraud and and mitigate that risk. And so what we're seeing is in you know with these new buy now pay later methods, you know we have to look at those same things. And in in these cases, these buy now pay later companies are typically going to be held liable to that fraud. Uh, but again, some of the newer companies don't necessarily have the the decades of fraud prevention capabilities in place, or even the sophistication of the new attack patterns of you know fraud at the point of an account enrollment versus what we're typically you know what we've traditionally done for fraud prevention at the point of a transaction. Now with buy now pay later, you've got both things happening at the same time. You both sign up for an account, much the same way you would you know apply for a credit card. But but seconds after your application, you're also making that purchase. Uh, so that's where some of those complications come in is, is the um, enrollment is happening really at the same time as the transaction and the purchase. So uh, so that liability comes in of, you know, who's actually making who, who's actually completing that purchase. And in this case, it's the, either the buy now, pay later vendor if you're using them directly or it falls back on, you know, again, the retroactive model uh, will fall back on your credit card company as well. Are we seeing circumstances where someone will, for example, make the first payment of, of a multi-payment agreement and then, you know, fall off the face of the earth that way? So, you know, buy some high price item and and only pay a little bit for it. Yeah, I mean, you know, and that's a, a different type of fraud. We call it first party fraud, where mm. you know you, they make the purchase, they've only paid a, par- a portion of that, but you know that presents a different type of risk, which is really the credit risk, right? And really not much different than if you, you know, you get a credit card, I give you a $10,000 limit and you rack up a charge on it, you know, you rack up $10,000 in balance and then you just don't pay the balance. Mm. So in that respect, it's still a, you know, that's still a credit risk sort of thing. Um, or we call first party fraud where people just are, are just not paying their, paying their agreement. Right. Yeah. But when we talk about fraud, it's typically somebody else, um, using your account or, you know, um, taking something that's not theirs, if you will. I see. So are, is buy now, pay later something that is best avoided or is it a, a legitimate tool when done right that uh, is good news for consumers? Well, I think for the consumers, I think it's a great, uh, it's yet another convenient way to pay for goods and services. But again, much like any new uh, payment method, it's not without its risks of fraud, et cetera. I don't think we should shy away from it from a consumer perspective, but understand that there are new risk areas where you have to protect your identity in much the same way. You know, we've tried to teach consumers to protect their credit card numbers, protect their identity. It's even more important now with these buy now, pay later approaches, because now with simple, you know, identity information, uh, somebody can go into a merchant and, and say, Hey, I'm Jim Ducharme. I'm from Southern Maine. Here's my address. Here's my phone number. I'd like to buy this. Oh, by the way, ship it to my house in New Jersey. And now, you know, they've put they've put the real Jim Ducham on a payment plan for merchandise they didn't even order. Consumers have to be more aware that there there are new types of ways that fraud can be committed against them other than just somebody stealing their credit card number. Mm. But I would encourage you know consumers to look at whatever methods of payment 
will work best for them, but be diligent about protecting their identity, protecting, you know, protecting all the information that, that fraudsters can use to impersonate them. What about on the merchant side? Uh, any extra things that they need to be on the lookout for if they engage with one of these providers of BNPL? Sure. On the merchant side, if there's new providers, right, you know, they've got to look at at where that liability does lie. What's their responsibility uh, in protecting that transaction, protecting a consumer? Working with the BNPL providers to understand what controls they put into place to prevent fraud. Because at the end of the day, even if the merchant isn't held liable for the fraud itself, i.e. the financial damages, there certainly can be reputational damages if a merchant you know, ha- uses a, a a payment method that fraudsters love to take advantage of. And, and you know, w- this is another type of thing that we track where we see certain merchants that are more susceptible to fraud than others. That results in a, in, in, because they don't have the necessary controls to prevent fraud. So it results in a reputational damage of, you know, that merchant has a lot of, uh, has a lot of fraud happening, results in reputational damage on the merchant. So I would encourage them to look at, you know, do the providers that they work with have the, the sufficient controls uh, in place to prevent fraud? What is the liability put on them? And, and what is the impact to the end user, right? What is that ultimate customer experience, their checkout experience? Because the number one thing merchants are going to care about is making sure they get the transaction. What is that? What is the ease of doing business with a merchant? Um, and now they're handing over a lot of that experience to a new type of payment provider. Joe, what do you think? You know, Dave, I have noticed my credit card providers offering this kind of service. Mm. Uh, like I'll get text messages going, hey, do you want to put that on a payment plan? Yeah. I just ignore them. But when I purchase my new phones, I use the Google Store's interest-free promotion. Oh, right? I see. Sure, sure. Uh, which is run through Synchrony Bank, which is, I guess, kind of like a buy now, pay later. Um, yeah. You got to be careful with these. One of the things I'll tell you is they have these retroactive interest clauses right. <laughs> that are right. usurious, if right. you will. So, right. if, you know, if they're perfectly fine with you not paying everything as you agree to pay uh, over time, you know, making smaller payments or, you know, if, if anything goes wrong during the course of you making these payments, they tack on all the interest yeah. that you that you would have accrued. Right. Retroactively. Retroactively. And it's a big number. Right. It yeah. is a big I, I don't know how this is legal. Uh, in the United States, but <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's it's interesting that it's the same scam that we're that we've always seen the synthetic the synthetic ID mm-hmm. uh, ID fraud. I think about when I was setting up my Google account because I actually used the same promotion to purchase my last Google phone, okay, the Pixel Three, yeah, um, and it was pretty easy for me to set that up. I imagine it would be pretty easy for someone to set up a. Uh, a fraudulent one as well, uh. right? So what was also interesting was it was weeks before I had to make a payment to this thing. Mm. So if somebody else set up a, a fraudulent account like this and then ordered some stuff and had it shipped, there would be there would be a long period of time where they, they, they would have to get these products in the mail mm-hmm. and a payment would be due or anybody would realize anything was wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, I think with a phone... There's a lot more recourse, right? Like you can you can put the the uh, unique equipment ID, whatever that number is. I can't remember what it is off the top of my head, but right. you can put that in a global database. There's actually a global database of invalid phones yeah. out there. Okay, uh, and some carriers won't even let you put them on their network because they're stolen phones. Okay, um, and they might be bricked. You can. Uh, I don't know if if uh, suppliers can brick the phones remotely. I have no idea. Yeah, uh, but other goods. They're gone, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and they're still useful to people. Right. If someone uses your name to do this, make sure that every conversation that you have with whoever's trying to collect on it is, indicates that you that this is a fraudulent transaction and you owe them nothing. Uh, make sure you say that. Never, never say, you know, and, and some of these guys will try to, you know, unethical collection officers will try to say, well, just tell me that this is a debt that you think you really owe. Yeah. Right. Right. You say that and they, they have you. Yeah. Now they now they can take take you to court and say this person owes me this money because here he admitted to owing it. Mm-hmm. Never even do that. Mm-hmm. They, no, I don't owe you this money. This is wrong. This is fraudulent. You're you're on the hook for the money. Don't bother me anymore. Right. Right. As far as account takeover goes, 
Same thing I say every time, Dave. Multi-factor authentication, multi-factor <laughs> authentication, multi-factor <laughs> authentication. Right, right. Right. It's an interesting question, who's on the hook? I don't care who's on the hook as long as it's not the consumer. Yeah. Right? I don't care if it's the manufacturer company or the uh, or the the uh, buy now, pay later company. I don't want the consumer being on the hook or being harassed for it. Mm. This is a uh, a business risk that you're taking. You're 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 going out on the limb here. You're offering this finance service. You're whenever money is offered in a finance service, that money is at risk, and it's a business decision that you're making. Mm -hmm. So, if you get scammed out of the money because somebody sets up a fraudulent account, don't har don't harass the consumer. Mm. So this buy now, pay later thing kind of is a, a relatively new experience for consumers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, have you done any of these? No, I mean I, I've I've taken advantage of some, you know, like you say, where somebody says, uh, you know, interest free payments over X number of months, right? And kind of my standard for that is if I can set up some sort of auto pay, right? Then I'll do it. Yep. And you know, it just makes my cash flow a little bit easier. But I'm not at risk of of falling into the the thing you described, where right. I'm going to be hit with some kind of big interest fee or something yeah. like that. I, I do it for things like phones. I think I've done it for furniture. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But those were those were managed through. Uh, the furniture one was actually through a Wells Fargo organization, mm -hmm. uh, and the phones are through Synchrony Bank. So, yeah. which is. Uh, that that's also who does the Amazon financing, the Amazon card financing. Yeah. Um, and their their rates are ridiculously high. So make sure you're paying those off every month if you have an Amazon card or if you have your phone. Don't don't get don't get caught back with those. Yeah. Um, it's it's a new vector for customers to be aware of. And if you're a merchant, uh, when you're thinking about your customers and how you're going to offer this kind of service to them, do your due diligence on that finance company. Make sure that there are you know, a bona fide company. Like, you know, Wells Fargo, I think, okay, good. I, Wells Fargo is a big company. They've been around for hundreds of years. Yeah. Maybe we use them. Synchrony Bank, I think they do a pretty good job of this. Yeah. Um, you know, they're a large company that 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 uh, that probably has a good security posture. But, right. <laughs> but ask about that. <laughs> Joe's Finance Emporium, maybe not so much. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, interesting conversation for sure. And uh, again, thanks to uh, Jim Descharm uh, from Outseer for taking the time to speak with us. We do appreciate it. And we want to thank our sponsors, Know Before. They are the social engineering experts and the pioneers of new school security awareness training. Be sure to take advantage of their free phishing test, which you can find at knowbefore.com slash fish test. Think of Know Before for your security training. That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. Our thanks to the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for their participation. You can learn more at isi.jhu.edu. The Hacking Humans podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our senior producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Joe Kerrigan. Thanks for listening. <laughs>